Thank you, Luis. Thanks for having me. Um, I will try to explain a bit about the journey that uh, I have been on personally with our company and uh, hopefully uh, put it into a perspective so it can be useful to you. Um, especially on, on the topic, where did you go, Luis? <laughs> he vanished. Especially on the topic uh, of uh, what is meaningful today and what can make a change. It's, uh, I will talk a lot about values, uh, values that also will relate to some practicalities in terms of sustainability or design that can be sustainable uh, beyond its material. So I talk about values um, and a personal journey, most of all. Um, so I will rewind the clock a bit because I represent a Danish uh, furniture company that is 133 years old. Um, and I'm fifth generation with my sister. Um, and uh, it's a, been a classic uh, family company. The craft is uh, handed down uh, from father to son, the traditional way that it has been done in the past. Um, and we have been the specialists in woodworking, especially in wood turning, as you saw the monkey, every bit of it is, is wood turning. So we have been the go-to guys in Denmark for this uh, special uh, craft. And we've done a lot of things uh, from uh, buildings uh, to art pieces to furniture, but always uh, as a supplier, as a manufacturer for, uh, for other, for architects, for furniture, architects, uh, designers, uh, etc. So we had our little uh, thumb on uh, some iconic uh, classic pieces from the Danish uh, archives throughout time, Vena and Finjul and etc. But, uh, but as a supplier on parts. So we've been, we've been playing with furniture uh, for generations. Um, but uh, you can say the, the real change in that setup has come about um, in my father's generation, where the idea of uh, evolving from hardcore manufacturer um, to a company that can embrace um, design and take upon design in-house and develop things, develop pieces that are dear to us, both in terms of what can we actually do, what is our skills, but also in terms of values. Um, so that is, uh, that is that journey that I will uh, talk a bit about um, how, how we have uh, evolved, because um, for us, um, it has been not a, a turnover, it's not a revolution that we were, we were doing, we, would, we were seeking on evolving what we had. Basically, uh, we wanted to make uh, uh, a full control uh, manufacturing company, we call it a self-producing design house. So that means uh, we are kind of the client and the, and the maker. Uh, uh, we, we come up with the ideas, we approach designers to make the designs, we produce them, we sell them, we market it, we do all the PR, we, everything from A to Z. Uh, so that's, there's a lot of uh, different hats on in our, in our company. It's a lot of hard work, I tell you that. But, um, but it's very rewarding in, this, in the sense that we are in, in full control. Uh, well, and sometimes we are. Um, and we're able to actually infuse some values into uh, what we do. Uh, values that are family values, but also uh, uh, progressive uh, values, I think so. Uh, not least because of my parents and, and them growing up in an environment uh, where uh, free thinking uh, uh, was, was uh, introduced in the, in the 60s. Part of, part of that thinking also led to uh, it was not obliged for me as a son, as the only son, to become the new head of the plant and uh, be hands-on. I was actually asked, would you like to do this instead of now you do it? 
Um, and that, uh, I think, was actually the key um, in opening up our business uh, and see it in a new way. Um, actually, I said no in the, to begin with. For many years, I said no. Um, for various reasons, I think I was uh, more creative, uh, had a more creative, cr creative personality. And back in those days was purely manufacturing. So they were quite disappointed, my grandmother uh, not least disappointed, to see this kind of break of the family chain. But uh, uh, I took on um, other crafts uh, in, that were in the creative field, graphic design and communication, and have been uh, in various uh, big companies as well, uh, international companies, and learned what is the world outside of the four walls of the workshop. Because uh, time is changing and uh, you, need to, uh, you, need to, uh, you need to relate to what's going on out there. So at a certain point, seven years ago, we returned, my sister and I, to the company and said, uh, we actually we are ready to take this on now. We feel like we have something to offer. This was not uh, being in the workshop hands-on, it was something else. It was a, a, a another perspective on how to uh, run a manufacturing business in, uh, in our days. Uh, and one of the first things that we wanted was, was this uh, idea about creating a uh, full circle uh, design house. Um, and, well, that's one idea. Then. How do we do it? What do we do? What is our role in the world? How do we connect with people? What kind of furniture do we do? Because more or less we had a clean slate. We didn't really have much furniture. We had a few pieces. We were lucky enough to have one classic design piece, a hands building tray table, a little round uh, table. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but that's a classic piece from the 50s. So we kind of uh, we looked at that and said, um, there are some many qualities in this that relates to us uh, in terms of craft, but also in terms of values, and, and it speaks to us as owners, as creatives, which I think is also important. We're also in a privileged situation where, uh, where we can actually we can think about uh, what we want to do in work. <laughs> That's a, we spend a lot of time uh, at work, uh, all of us, and be able to create something meaningful is uh, is quite important. So, um, so uh, I emerged with a young uh, design studio in Copenhagen at that time, who uh, who was specialising in strategic uh, uh, thinking for design businesses, and we took on the challenge with them. What do we do? What don't we do? We looked at many, many different options. Uh, we can turn this into a volume business, we can outsource production, we can close it down and all the heritage stuff, uh, cheap, so many things. And, uh, and we kept coming back to, you know, does the world really need another chair? I mean, are we really doing something that important here? Um, we're doing something that you can sit on and uh, it serves a practical purpose. Can, can, can we, what, what is our role in the world today here? So we scrapped all the ideas about outsourcing and all that stuff and said, let's stay true to uh, what we do, to our heritage, uh, Danish made, uh, Danish employed, uh, and do it the difficult and the hard way, because it is uh, with the high cost to produce in Denmark. And um, it, is, uh, it is difficult to compete in a world with uh, lots of outsourcing and where Companies these days has uh, fall the winter collections and uh, trend colors, and they all go to the same uh, uh, trend forecasters for the same color palette every season, and this and that. And we can, it's impossible for us to keep up uh, with this pace, and maybe we don't want to keep up with this pace. Maybe we don't want to contribute to the huge uh, plastic uh, uh, island in the ocean. That's not an island, I was corrected on that. But you know what I mean, it's a tons, tons of waste. Why, why contribute to that? Why, why don't we do what is dear to our hearts and what can play a role? Um, so, in a way, our restraint, 
I think became our strength. Uh, we turned the restraint around in a way. At least we tried to, and tried to rethink uh, what what is relevance, what is uh, what is meaningful design, what is design you want to keep, what is design you want to invest in, um, and we look to other people that, especially I admire very much, to see how do they go about it, other uh, people that has chosen uh, great restrictions and, and turned it into something uh, quite amazing. Um, and I, I want to mention a few. Um, one of them is, uh, is the Noma restaurant in Denmark, if you are uh, aware of the restaurant. Um, they chose a decade ago uh, or so, might, maybe more, they chose to go for a purely local Nordic cuisine based on Nordic ingredients. That is in itself a huge restriction. Uh, you don't have the, the, the treasure of uh, Southern European uh, uh, groceries that you can dig into. That a tomato just tastes amazing. In Denmark, it doesn't taste like anything. So, and tri the, 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 the Danish kitchen uh, before Norma was meatballs and potatoes. I mean, there was more or less nothing there. Um, fine dining was French. We tried to make it like the French and we didn't do it as good as they did. So what do you do? with a huge restraint like that. Let's, let's evolve the Danish kitchen. And they do it partly by great craftsmanship. I mean, you cannot do this only with uh, great ideas and, uh, and a fluffy uh, storytelling. Uh, you need to be great craftsmen. And they are great craftsmen. They really know how to cook and make it taste. And they went out to the forest, to the beaches, to the side of the ditch and the roads and they found ingredients we never knew existed. Uh, wheat even, they cook wheat and then make it delicious. Uh, wheat that was growing in the side of a highway. So it's not truffles and etc. They, they, uh, they have a very humble approach and with great craftsmanship, they turn it into something very tasty. What they also are good at is not only the taste, but it's connecting with people. They are able to connect on a level that you will never forget the dish that you had at that place. At least I don't. I had that experience eating there once. Uh, I can, I can actually, I can t tell you what I ate. <laughs> it was uh, the to the table came just a huge warm beach rock, and then on the side of it there was a few ingredients, and there was no fork and knife. There was nothing. There was a hot beach rock. Then there was a bit of seaweed dust and there was a raw lobster tail and there was uh, some foam made from herring and herbs. So they didn't serve it for you, they just explained, now you pour the crust, the seaweed dust onto the hot stone, you put some of the herring foam and you put on the tail. And we recommend one, two minutes, then it's good for eating. You can also keep it longer if you want. It's all about density and etc. but it's safe to eat. And we all did this and we're like, okay, uh, are, we this, are we paying a lot of money for this? <laughs> um, but then your senses were awoken. I mean, you, you were hands on, you didn't have cutlery. You, the hot rock was like a hot summer day on the beach and the, the, the seaweed dust, you could smell it. You, you were almost there. I mean, it's kind of like the movie uh, Ratatouille, remember that? <laughs> Where he's like back to his childhood. I had that kind of moment. And, and you just take the lobster tail and you dip it into the stuff and you eat it. And it was, it was so simple. It was so simple. It was a great idea. And I will never forget that dish. So it was, it was not only <coughs> they know how to put ingredients together, so it tastes great. Uh, like, like great alchemists or chefs, but this whole theater involving you, breaking down the barrier of fine dining and that whole uh, intense atmosphere there is, they made it an amazing experience. So that's one of the things I take with me when, 
when designing furniture. We need to relate to people. Um, that will make it special, that will make it meaningful and personal, and not just another chair in this autumn's colour. Um, having said that, it's quite difficult. Another, another example of uh, turning a restriction around to uh, an obstacle into a, 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 a something positive uh, is a big architects, Bjarke Ingels group in Copenhagen as well. They uh, recently uh, made a huge power plant uh, in the city. Um, and that's uh, very close to the city. So in itself, it is, a, it is a strange location to build a new power plant. These, these uh, power plants are often like an industrial beast. Uh, you don't want to get near it. You are, there's fences around it. You can't get into it. It's unhuman territory. So what they did is they actually turned the power plant into a giant ski slope. So it has a slant like this and it doesn't look like this beast in the horizon because it has a different shape and a little curvitation and it's quite different power plant. It looks, and they deliberately put in what looks like windows so it looks like uh, someone lives there. And, uh, and it's also... It's not a traditional power plant, they, they, uh, it's a renewable uh, energy plant. They burn waste into energy. So in, in that sense, it's also it's better than the typical uh, black beast of a coal plant, or etc. But it was quite interesting to me how they invert, inverted the challenge and made it human and inviting and engaging. And you, uh, I think they're testing it now, but soon it will be open for families to go skiing on a power plant um, and that also triggers something uh, in my mind um, turning obstacles around to benefits or to not necessarily benefits but something that connects with people i think that's a that's a key um, i think in the case with both noma and big and many other great um, uh, thinkers and, and makers, um, you never have a hundred percent creative freedom. This 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 sounds uh, almost like they dreamed it and they had a dream client, they bought it or something. But I think they are also very good at playing with those very very few uh, options that you have left in a lot of restrictions. Um, and I saw a, a quite um, inspiring interview with Frank Gehry, the American architect who said he had a conversation with Sidney Pollock about their creative freedom and they were bashing each other, who's the more creative. Uh, and they both came up with the exact percentage of creative freedom they have left after dealing with clients and Hollywood and uh, permits for buildings and uh, budgets and gravity uh, and materials. I mean, the building has to stand. So they actually say, well, what is left is 15%. 15 is quite uh, precise, but 15% creative freedom is, is left. Um, and when you see some of Frank Gehry's building, it's, uh, he evolved architecture into something new, uh, like the Disney Orchestra Hall, I think it's called in, in, uh, in US. He made many amazing, amazing uh, projects that looks like he just did something fluffy and the, Dream, dream client, uh, but it wasn't like that. The the the, uh, the orchestra building uh, was actually this weird curvitation of a house that is everywhere. Is actually from a very uh, tight um, uh, study on uh, the um, what do you call it? the sound um, the acoustics acoustic techniques of the hall, which had all kinds of funny angles. So he said, well. Why don't we prolong all the funny angles to the exterior and outside and became this uh, funny thing? So restriction becomes, uh, yeah. And what I take from that is, uh, is storytelling mainly and, and how to connect with people, how to cre create emotional design that is not necessarily emotional. I mean, the monkey that Luis just showed is purely emotional design. Um, but we are doing something that has a function. We also have to deal with gravity and, 
materials and budgets and many, many, many things. Um, and I think coming back to the big challenge where everybody, uh, every, every, where everyone is facing uh, about resources in the world, I think we spend 1.7 times the resources we actually have uh, in the world. So there's a, there's, a, there's a, the math doesn't add up and we need to do something. And, and I thought, well, uh, when, when evolving design, we, we have a long history, we really know how to make uh, stuff work and make stuff last. So that's, uh, that's something we are good at. But uh, we were not necessarily good at designing from the beginning in my company, but I mean, it's an, it's it's fine to make a chair that really lasts, but if it's not, it, if it doesn't connect, if it's not, you know, it doesn't look nice, then no one will buy it, no one will keep it. Um, and I want to, as you probably all know, uh, there's a few things you work with in in terms of uh, in terms of um, sustainability. You reduce materials. You make sure that it is recyclable, and um, and um, reusable is even better, and um, and a long last, long lasting life. So we thought there, if we can do something about all these things, because um, we know something about that, especially the long lasting life, because someone holds it dear, because it connects with people. How do we, how do we do that? That's the tricky part. Uh, I'm not saying then that I have a solution, but at least I'll. <laughs> I'll explain a bit about uh, how our journey has been uh, in coming up with designs that connects in one way or the other. Um, and for this, uh, I would actually like to hand out some uh, material that you can look at. It's actually our catalog, but uh, I thought instead of having it on a screen, we can have a look in the papers. So. One example that I want to show you is on page 20. This is, uh, this is a chair that we were very inspired by history, what has been done before. Uh, and can we maybe improve it? There's so much knowledge out there, just like Frank Gehry said, 15%. When you develop furniture, I think if you do something 100% new, everybody will look at it and run away because it will be alien. You need to maybe be 80, 90% familiar. It needs to feel like I saw this before. It has four legs. It's a, also a pragmatic starting point, but then already you know it's a chair. I mean, so familiarity is quite good. And if you can give it that 10, 20% of new edge something, um, then it has uh, an appeal, and hopefully this shouldn't be only in colors. It should be uh, that it uh, that it adds something. Anyway, we we wanted to play with an archetype, uh, the the folk chair, the the shaker chair that is in thousands of variations. You see it in Van Gogh paintings. You see it in so many places. It's a real folk chair. Back in the days. Uh, the makers were actually tying the seat uh, with a broad uh, strap and this wasn't for looks, it was actually to keep the chair together. So it was sticks put together and then it was bound together to hold. Uh, and this was quite interesting. Uh, we thought, first of all, let's reduce everything on that archetype so it doesn't feel uh, old and to improve comfort. It's quite important as well. You see the front leg, usually you have a, like, a, like a big round high ending on it, on its typical archetype chair. To me, that's, that's just like a, a, a stone in your shoe. You, when you sit on it, it, it eats uh, your leg. I want to remove that. And also it, it brings about some modernity. Uh, and what I think is, there's a lot of historical references in this. Uh, the pure wood turning and of course the historical references etc and the binding technique of the seat and we thought well let's work more on that that's quite interesting what is the technique you used back in the days was natural fibers but uh, they also have a long uh, uh, a short life uh, they're very difficult to clean when you spill food or wine in it 
and they will give in. There's too much, it will, uh, the elong, gasity, elong, what do you call it in English? El yeah, yeah, exactly. It gives in. This, the, they will be weak by time. So we thought, what is the modern material of the day? And we found this industrial polyester that is super strong and it doesn't give in. Uh, is it sustainable? Well, yes, because it is so strong that it will last you longer than the natural fibers. And the shelf life of this or the life is very important. And you can clean it with whatever you want from your household cabinet. And, uh, it, um, and um, antibacterial, anti, uh, it doesn't burn. There's so many, you know, features that makes it, that actually improves this archetype chair with an industrial material. So the challenge was how do they then make this industrial material uh, look nice? Um, and we think we solved it by uh, combining the traditional technique from the shaker culture where you bind the chair so it looks like a chessboard uh, in the pattern on top with the traditional Danish weaving, where you meet in an envelope and a cross on the middle. So we, and that was typically done with paper cord, like, like a string. So merging those two traditions, and then we come up with something that almost looks like a killing pattern or something. But it has similarity, I mean familiarity. It has something from Scandinavian roots, something from the Shaker, something from here and there, but yes, yet it's slightly new. Um, so that was, uh, that's an example for me, at least in the process, how we try to incorporate um, some of this thinking. If I succeeded, uh, I'll, I'll let up to you. Um, but at least that was kind of thinking we, uh, we wanted to uh, put into it. I'll talk a little about uh, practicalities. We have a few, um, few furniture that uh, seamlessly is uh, very practical. I uh, can start with uh, our lounge chair on page 36. This was one of the first things that uh, I was involved with. We launched it in 14, I think. Um, and to, that sort of embodies the familiarity and something slightly new. Uh, the frame of the chair is reminiscent of uh, classic uh, Danish modern and the, the big uh, backrest is uh, over dimensioned, uh, bulky, uh, almost geometrical um, and brings something else that is uh, unusual. The craftsmanship you see on the, the joinery here is also something that I'm not aware of has been done before. It was very difficult to do, st still is, uh, but it brings some. It some, brings something valuable, something you treasure. It's very beautiful uh, and to see and to touch. Um, so that was some of the philosophy and the craftsmanship. And and then we are, the seat that you see here is uh, is constructed in a way that you can you can uh, demount it with a simple hexagon key like uh, IKEA is doing. Uh, so the the idea was. It's a little surprise element uh, that you, in this category, above average category of furniture, is working with these practical things. But it, it's not just a gimmick, it, it actually is with a purpose that you're able to replace the seat whenever it's worn down and it needs a new seat. So you don't need to send the chair somewhere and get it fixed. We can send a new chair out to you and with a hexagon key you can, you can uh, fix it yourself. That's a huge benefit when you send furniture to Japan, or Australia, or US, or wherever. Uh, that makes a lot of sense uh, in terms uh, of uh, our resources. Uh, if you if you turn the page over to forty, uh, there's the the little sister or little brother of the chair in the same um, same family, but a dining chair, and it's exactly the same principle uh, here with hexagon keys take the seat out and the same principle applies to uh, our new uh, bar chairs that are on page 28. Uh, you can you can demount it both the seat itself uh, or the backrest. There's a bit of engineering 
uh, going into it, but uh, and uh, and it, it's not that it's not the easy way, but I think it's the important way to uh, to do it like this. If you go to page 44, we launched. Uh, it was also the, one of the first things that we that we launched, or I, I was involved with in in, in uh, 14. Uh, it's a wooden lamp. Uh, the the shade is um, is uh, wood turned. It's very thin. It's like five millimeter shade. It's quite difficult to do. Also, uh, this is something that was impossible to do before uh, invention of LED. This would simply burn or crack or whatever. Now LED is uh, is not something uh, new, but uh, at the time it was still a little uh, on um, unexplored territory. Uh, and we explored many things how to implement LED light into. And the easy solution would be. To, to chip, uh, to weld a chip inside of the lamp. These uh, chips have maybe a lifetime of 10 years, all good. But then what happens in 10 years? Then you would have to throw out the lamp and buy a new lamp. So we, we did it again the hard way to implement it with a system so you can use uh, an LED bulb that is rechangeable re uh, and you can buy it in your local uh, grocery store. So uh, that Today it's maybe not uh, something wow, but <laughs> in, in 14 it took, uh, took some effort to do this. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's important, it's about values. Um, it's not actually something we talk a lot about uh, when we sell our things. Uh, to us it's hygiene. I mean, this is, this is how it's supposed to be, kind of. So, um, and um, yeah, I can briefly I could go on for hours about how amazing we are, but uh, <laughs> if you go to page 18, uh, this table has a luxurious feel, uh, but it's actually also knocked down. So the three legs you see there uh, are not joined. They simply rest uh, in each other uh, with very, very precise craftsmanship. And the glass plate resting on it is, uh, is uh, with some hidden um, hidden um, features uh, where you ha we have a, a metal a dowel going inside of the leg, hidden inside of the leg, and inside of the leg is a magnet that's so strong that you can lift the table. It lifts the weight of the table, uh, so it keeps the table in in place. The the, pl the top cannot sketch off. Um, you can move it around, but you can also with the right technique, pop it off and fold it again. That means a dining table we ship uh, in a pack that is uh, this wide, or the same for a coffee table, etc. Uh, it's it requires extreme precision and it's difficult, but again, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so that's our little contribution. We're not maybe not saving the world here, but uh, we do what we can here and there, and I think it's important to. To do uh, to do these uh, things, both technically, but also um, in in terms terms of storytelling, um, and a, 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 an example of st a, st a storytelling piece is this um, is this table that we did for actually uh, a restaurant in Tokyo. Um, so we thought with the designer with OEO Studio, we thought how. How can we make uh, a table? It's a it's a Danish uh, Danish restaurant in Tokyo, uh, working with uh, Japanese ingredients. Not doing Danish or Japanese cuisine, but trying to just reinvent the whole thing. It's uh, it's again it's the Noma Group involved in this. Um, so we thought, how how do we connect with something cultural in uh, in in Japan, but also for outside of Japan. And, and uh, Thomas Lugge uh, of uh, OEO Studio, very great designer, we have a great collaboration with, have done uh, have since the beginning, came up with working with the, the notion uh, or the feeling of uh, pebbles, stones that have been uh, rounded in water for centuries. Uh, you probably uh, know them from Zen gardens in, Jap in Japanese culture, or, but they, are, they often have it's a very round characteristic, uh, asymmetric shape. It's so nice to hold and, and, and feel. How can we adapt this feeling 
of timelessness and tactility and deep rooted culture into a table. So we, we made the table that is completely asymmetrical. Nothing is the same on any of the edges. And it has very deep rounded edges. It's very tactile. You, you just want to feel the edge and the table when you, when you sit by it. And we developed a stain ourselves that is a mix of uh, rocks and minerals to achieve this blue hue that was a signature key in the restaurant, a uh, signature hue in the restaurant. So it gets this kind of a stony uh, surface, but it's not. You still see the, the, the natural uh, material coming through. Um, and, uh, and I think also it's, made, uh, it, it's difficult to make. It takes a lot of time. Uh, it's made by hand. It's stained by hand. It's, in a way, there's connection with the whole philosophy or the idea of something very slow and the way that it's crafted. So it has deep roots, but it also has something, there's something in our time that is relevant when we talk about slowness, because we all uh, feel the burn. We all uh, stressed, we all, we work too much. We don't have time to dwell. We don't have time to be in the now and etc. and etc. So maybe we can create a piece that actually is uh, something you can, you can have this feeling of timelessness in a way when you sit around it and the, 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 the long table you see is kind of a elliptic shape but not it's kind of a rump shape so we take the traditional uh, surface but redistribute it so you sit in a kind of elliptic uh, way around uh, the table which is also the perfect uh, perfect uh, shape for social presence. When you sit in a dinner, everybody can see each other. You don't have that, you don't have to lean in, in over like that. So there are many things that we try to, to incorporate in the, in the process. And then uh, we've, we've also done a lot of experimental work where we, we allow the, the restrictions to be less speaking of 15%. But we did a piece, uh, we did actually two pieces for wallpaper handmade. Uh, this year we participated, but we also did another piece in, uh, I think it was 15, where we did uh, a purely wood-turned piece where we worked with off-axis techniques. So we don't have the traditional symmetric shape. It's out of shape, out of symmetry. And we stained it also in a very funny uh, greenish, bluish tone that takes its color from the wood grain, etc. Et we played a lot around with that. There's a lot of storytelling about old wood turning company, experimenting, being open-minded, giving, deliberately giving room for experiment. Uh, I, we, we love to, to do that. Uh, and actually that project led to us being invited to uh, creating the furniture for the new Noma restaurant that was uh, built in Copenhagen, which uh, we were extremely thrilled to uh, to be invited for this, uh, create signature uh, furniture. Uh, this was uh, studio David Tulstrup who uh, did the, uh, uh, the, all the interior and big architects did the buildings themselves. Uh, David and uh, Rene Ritzibi, the head chef and founder of Noma, looked at countless dining chairs for the restaurant. The restaurant, the, the chairs was extremely important for, for both of them. It's where the, the guests will spend a lot of hours. It needs to embrace the guests. It needs a lot of practicality, but also storytelling in, in their universe. It needs to back up the universe. And they tried many, many uh, different chairs. They had David's studio were lined up with countless chairs. They tried it both on the market or out of market, vintage pieces, all kinds of stuff. And nothing really checked the boxes. Uh, and that then the idea came about, why don't we design a new chair? And we were called in because of our, you can say, trustworthiness. We know how to make furniture, but also our willingness to experiment. Also experiment with an extreme short deadline. That was also a big part of it. So we managed to make a prototype in five days that the head shift could sit in and it didn't break. And he could say, okay, this is the way we go, instead of going to something on the shelves. And then uh, it was extremely hectic, but we managed to uh, we managed to uh, 
to create signature piece. You'll see it on page 12. We managed to create uh, signature pieces. And to me, that was quite funny. I mean, there, I can say many, many amazing things about this uh, project and the design, the relatability, uh, etc. But to me, it was kind of like uh, coming back to the starting point. Do the chair, do, do the world really need another chair? I think this was a, it was a fun example of, well, it, in this case, it actually did. They tried so many things, they couldn't. I'm very proud to be uh, a part of that um, of that project. Uh, we did it for Noma, and and it's uh, something that we, as part of our permanent permanent uh, collection. I think that uh, kind of sums up uh, the journey that we've been on so far. This is one of the latest projects, the Noma project and the and the Tokyo project. We have a new project coming up. Uh, Hopefully uh, next year I can reveal more on that, but, but this is up to date as it gets. Uh, actually, uh, I have a nice anecdote to, uh, to round up. Um, we recently we had a, a couple coming into our factory and looking at the round table for four from Noma uh, in our showroom. And they really wanted to buy it, and they've been looking at it for a long time. And they had uh, young kids, and they, and they said, we were really looking for a nice dining table. That's where the family meets. It's such a gathering place. And we want something that we are able to pass on to our grandchildren. And then uh, my mother almost cried in the factory. Because that, that is, that's, that's the ultimate. Uh, then you really want to keep the design, and it's built to last. Um, I think if we can all all do what we can here and there for, for those kind of decisions, yeah. it's for the better. I'm done. <laughs>